Exodus chapter five. Afterward, Moses and Aaron came and said to Pharaoh, this is what Yahweh the God of Israel says, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, who is this Yahweh that I should listen to his voice and let Israel go? I don't know Yahweh and moreover, I will not let Israel go. They said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go three days journey into the wilderness and sacrifice to Yahweh our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or sword. The king of Egypt said to them, why do you, Moses and Aaron, take the people from their work? Get back to your burdens. Pharaoh said, behold, the people of the land are now many, and you make them rest from their burdens. The same day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their officers saying, you shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks as before. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. The number of the bricks which they made before, you require from them. You shall not diminish anything of it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry, saying, let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let heavy work be laid upon them, that they may labor therein, and don't let them pay any attention to lying words. The taskmasters of the people went out, and their officers, and they spoke to the people, saying, this is what Pharaoh says, I will not give you straw. Go yourselves and get straw where you can find it, for nothing of your work shall be diminished. So the people were scattered abroad throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. The taskmasters were urgent, saying, fulfill your work quota daily, as when there was straw. The officers of the children of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and demanded, why haven't you fulfilled your quota both yesterday and today? in making bricks as before. Then the officers of the children of Israel came and cried to Pharaoh saying, why do you deal this way with your servants? No straw is given to your servants and they tell us, make brick. And behold, your servants are beaten, but the fault is in your own people. But he said, you are idle, you are idle. Therefore you say, let us go and sacrifice to Yahweh. Go therefore now and work for no straw shall be given to you, yet you shall deliver the same number of bricks. The officers of the children of Israel saw that they were in trouble, when it was said, you shall not diminish anything from your daily quota of bricks. They met Moses and Aaron who stood in the way as they came forth from Pharaoh. And they said to them, may Yahweh look at you and judge, because you have made us a stench to be abhorred in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of his servants, to put a sword in their hand to kill us. Moses returned to Yahweh and said, Lord, why have you brought this trouble on this people? Why is it that you have sent me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble on this people and neither have you delivered your people at all. This chapter, starts with Moses finally going to Pharaoh and saying, let my people go. It's the beginning of his obedience, but the name of the Pharaoh is not mentioned here. There's some theories about the name. Um, the popular opinion, uh, it's in the National Geographic, it's in the Prince of Egypt movie and other movies. The popular opinion is this is Ramses the Great or Ramses the Second from the 19th dynasty of Egypt. Um, there's Egyptian chronology is all over the place. So there's lots of opinions and, and lots of archeologists have different chronological opinions. And um, I, I'm not sure that it's Ramses too because the, um, the dating of, of Israel doesn't work out. Like by this point, Israel's probably already left. But, and, there's, and the reason I think that is, is you know, what I know of the Bible and Dr. David Downs is a Seventh-day Adventist Egyptologist. Um, and he studied all of this. He thinks that the Pharaoh was, I'm gonna read it off my paper, Kazakh Kemri Neferhotep. So there you go. We don't know who it is anyway, and no one can say who it is for sure. And, um, but one thing's for sure is that Moses, I think, deliberately does not write down the name of the Pharaoh. Because there's lots of other places in the Bible where the name of the king of Egypt is mentioned. 
Um, even in the book of Genesis, you know, Abraham goes to Egypt and the name of the, the leader there is mentioned. But here, it's left out. And I think Moses does it on purpose. <laughs> and uh, I don't know whether he just didn't like that guy and he's not gonna name him, or whether there's a cultural reason and just at that time, or whether maybe God didn't want this guy to get named because he was so proud and arrogant. And he, and, you know, if it was Ramses II, Ramses II built statues of himself everywhere. Down at um, Abu Simbel, there was this gigantic temple. Statues of Ramses, like huge. <laughs> and then statues of his wife next to him, little tiny wife, giant Ramses. And so he was so proud. Well, if it was Ramses, you know, maybe God was just not wanting to add to the pride, not, not wanting to give him a mention in the Bible at all. But, you know, there are other theories, you know, one of the things that happened was that when Moses, when Moses um, took the children of Israel out of Egypt, the Pharaoh afterwards scrubbed Moses' name out of all Egyptian history. And this used to happen. Pharaohs, when they ascended to the throne, if they didn't like someone, they would scrub them all out. Sometimes you'd, they'd find uh, archaeology, you know, tablets and things where there's like been chiseling marks through th some, someone's name's gone. And um, even King Seti, you know, when he published a chronology of all the kings, he left some pharaohs completely out. And so that's one of the problems with Moses, is you try trying to find archeological information about Moses. Well, a lot of it was scrubbed out because they didn't like Moses after he left. But interestingly, there's archeological evidence for Joseph. He's older than Moses. And for Manasseh and Ephraim and Jacob and, and Asnath, Joseph's wife. So, and of course there's archeological evidence after Moses for you know, the children of Israel and um, there's a lot of archeological evidence but Moses is a hard one to find. And I think it's because when he left, they tried to chisel his name out and I just wonder whether God's just decided to leave this Pharaoh's name out of the Bible too. Can't say for sure. But anyway, one of the things about the Pharaohs is they thought that they were God. Or well, they thought they were the son of the morning, the son of the, the son of the gods. They they kind of saw themselves in a divine light. So when Moses comes to Pharaoh and says, Let my people go, the God of the Hebrews is spoken, the way that this is is perceived at, um, by Pharaoh is like a battle of the gods. We don't kind of think that when we read it as you know Australians or as Europeans or Westerners living, you know, thousands of years later. But this is a battle of the of divine will. And Pharaoh, you know, he thinks about the Hebrews and they're just slaves. And he thinks the the God of any slaves isn't isn't a any God at all. He doesn't think it could possibly be any God worth considering. He may not even believe it's a real God. He says, Who is this Yahweh? Never heard of him. And they say the God of the Hebrews. And he's like, in his mind, no, I'm not letting the people go. So he thinks he's important, he thinks he's godlike, and he's definitely not going to listen to the god of slaves. And so his response is, make things worse. No, nah, you guys are obviously lazy because you're sitting around thinking about getting away and having a break. He said, no, nah, I'm gonna make your work harder. And so this is sometimes what happens when we pray. Sometimes when we pray, we think God's just gonna come in and just make it better. Sometimes it gets worse. And so the children of Israel have prayed, they want to be delivered from slavery. God sends Moses in and it gets worse. So the, 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 the immediate answer to their prayer is it seems less likely that they're going to get an answer to prayer. And we actually must remember that because sometimes there's a process because God didn't want to just deliver them from slavery. He wanted to establish them as a nation and establish them with wealth. And to do that, things had to get worse first so that they could be even better later. So when we pray and things get worse, we just say to ourselves, God's up to something. He's giving us an even better outcome than what we could possibly have hoped for. So that's something to encourage yourself with. Remind yourself that when things get worse as you pray, God's up to something even better than you could have thought. And at the end of the chapter, the Israelites complain against Moses saying, you've just made our life tougher and they didn't want to listen to him anymore. And I just wanted to read to you this scripture from Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, because it reminds me of how there are pastors all around the world, pastors that are saying the thing that God told them to say, and they're doing the thing that God told them to do, but their people don't like their leaders. 
just like Moses was doing what God said, saying what God said, but the people here didn't like it. So this scripture from Hebrews 13 just speaks right to that. It says, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work may be a joy and not a burden because that would be of no benefit to you. And at the end of the chapter, you know, after the people have grumbled against Moses, Moses says to God, why did you send me? So obviously Moses' work was not a joy to him and it was a great burden. So we want to avoid doing that to our leaders. So that's the challenge I put before you today. Honor your leaders, respect them, try to support them, make their job pleasant. And of course, keep in mind that sometimes prayers get answered worse first and then better later. So Father, I pray, help us to always remember these things. Help us to love our leaders. Put in us a love for our leaders so that even in those times where we don't understand what they're doing or why, we might still be supportive and grace, full of grace and loyal and faithful and serving. So Lord, let all these things fill our hearts just as they filled the heart of Jesus. So Lord, bless your people today. Amen.